Yeah, we're doing it. Revelation 11. Who are the two witnesses? Let's go. Okay, so who are the two witnesses of Revelation 11? I've never had so much excitement for a video before and who the two witnesses are, and it's a question I get hit with a lot. And it seems everyone has made up their mind that it's Elijah or that it's Moses or it's the law and the prophets. So with that said, there's no point for the video. Sorry, I've just wanted to throw that instant transmission technique in there for a while now. So anyway, on with the video. It makes a lot of sense that the witnesses are Elijah and Moses. We'll note that the fire that comes out of their mouths is similar to how Elijah called down the fire from heaven, or the plagues that turning the water into blood is a clear allusion to Moses. Here's the issue. Before we decide who the witnesses are, we need to understand whether or not this was written before the destruction of the second temple or after, because the implications are huge for how we interpret the text. Because if it is written after, it is referring to an unbuilt third temple. If it was written before 70 AD, then it's clearly about the destruction of the second temple. Now, if you've watched my channel before, you would know that I believe that Revelation is written before 70 AD. Here's a video here of the reasons why, but I also encourage you to read Before Jerusalem Fell by Dr. Kenneth Gentry. However, according to the Revelation 11, I'll tell you why I believe it's referring to the fall of the second temple before 70 AD. In the opening verse, John is given a measuring rod to measure the temple. This makes us think of Ezekiel chapter 40 verse 3. He saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and measuring rod in his hand. The man measures a new temple in which the glory of God would return. This is a vision of restoration following from repentance and judgment. And it seems a bit more like the vision that John sees in Revelation 21. And it's noteworthy that Ezekiel's new temple is so big. It's far bigger than the actual temple mount that it's supposed to fit on. It's so large, in fact, take a look at this shot and the actual scale of the previous temples. It's not unreasonable to spiritualize this temple knowing the size of it. And in the event that Christians believe that a third temple is to be rebuilt in the future, which is plausible. It won't be Ezekiel's temple, but a replica of Solomon's temple. That's the most likely scenario. And it's important that we keep in mind that the restoration of this temple does come after judgment. And since John is drawing constantly from the Old Testament, such as Ezekiel's four judgments of Jerusalem, those judgments are the same punishments that John lists as the four horsemen in Revelation. The actual measuring line that he references or the rod is often associated with judgment and destruction. For instance, instance, 2 Samuel 8, 2, 2 Kings 21, 13, Isaiah 28, 17, Isaiah 34, 11, Lamentations 2, 8, Amos 7, verses 7 to 9. So you see the dilemma here. If it's written after 70 AD destruction, John is prophesying the destruction of an unbuilt third temple, which will need to be destroyed which creates these theological problems for Christians concerning the new covenant that we have with Jesus. The alternative scenario is the temple is still standing when John is writing it and is measuring up because it's about to be destroyed. Keep in mind, he is to measure the temple and the altar. The outer court is to be trampled on the city for 42 months by the Gentiles, which happens to coincide perfectly with the Roman Jewish war from 67 AD to 70 AD when Rome conquered Jerusalem. Now, every other temple or altar reference in Revelation, the temple is in heaven. Revelation 3.12, 6.9, 7.15, 8.35, 8.36, 16, 5-8, And we know at the end of the story, the holy city comes down from heaven to earth, which is Revelation 21. But there is no literal temple. And that's because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, Revelation 21, 22. And we also see this as Jesus as the temple in John 2, 21, being the way, the truth, and the life, the names of the three doors which lead to the Holy of Holies. And this new restorative, redemptive temple that is now accessible through your faith in Jesus, you have that access to the presence of God now through Christ. You see, Jesus put an end to sacrifice and offering, and the third temple doesn't serve any function which coincides with what Jesus taught in the new covenant. The reason people think that one of the witnesses is Elijah is because of the call from fire from heaven. This type of judgment language on the temple is also prophetic precedent required before 
before the day of the Lord, which we see in Malachi 4. Elijah had to come before the day of the Lord. And we see Jesus questioned with this, and he did come in spirit and truth with John the Baptist, but also on the Mount of Transfiguration, along with Moses, seeing that prophecy fulfilled. You see, it's for these reasons the contextual and theological references in Revelation 11, along with the temporal references elsewhere in the book, including the seven kings of Revelation 17 with the sixth king that is pointing to Roman Caesar Nero, and the beast that is numbered 666 of Revelation 13, which in Gematria spells Caesar Nero in Hebrew, all of this pointing to the destruction, the prophecy of the destruction of the second temple. So with that said, on with the two witnesses and who they are. Let's go. For those that do believe it's Moses and Elijah, well, it does sound like that, but there's no historical evidence to suggest that Moses and Elijah came before 70 AD. And even if you still think this is about a third unbuilt temple in the future, or if you believe there's a dual fulfillment in the future, which is perfectly fine with me, Moses and Elijah are in their heavenly bodies. Now, theologically speaking, I don't believe that they can die because remember, these witnesses die and their bodies are left for three and a half days, which is also a problem before or after 70 AD. So we have to rule out the idea that being Moses and Elijah, because we have to assume that they die. And then yes, Enoch is similar to Elijah being taken up into heaven, but the same problem exists for Enoch as well, because he is in his heavenly body. So what are the other options which is left? Well, one of them is that before 70 AD, uh, the two witnesses could be, say, Peter and Paul, who were executed by Nero in 64 AD. Or some scholars have prophet it could be the two Jameses. James, the brother of John, who was killed by Herod in Acts 2. Or James, the brother of Jesus, who went on to lead the church in Jerusalem and was killed by anti-Christian Jews. We know this from Josephus, the first century historian. But if you are curious and want some Easter eggs in the Bible in Acts that say that James was the leader of the church, check out these passages. Acts 12, 17. Acts 15, 13. Acts 21, 18. But... The issue with this theory is that there's no historical evidence of the events described in Revelation 11 actually happening in Jerusalem or in Rome prior to 70 AD. And you'll find that every theory seems to have a hole in it. But the only thing that comes close to this is the slaying of the priests of Ananus and Joshua in Jerusalem by the Edominians during the revolt against Rome, and their bodies were left unburied too. So if that's not the answer, what's the final option? Well, I believe it to be the best answer in my opinion, but before I reveal it, let's discuss something first. Let's go to verse 3. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Okay, firstly, the witnesses are central to revelation in general, and the minimum number needed in the Torah to establish a claim are two. Now, we can't overlook, there is a clear intertextual reference to Zechariah 4, a gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. When he asks what the meaning of this is, he's told, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So someone like Dr. Richard Balcom would say this is a reference from John, which points to the rebuilding of the temple after it had been destroyed in 70 AD. And again, pointed to this third future unbuilt temple. However, if we go back to Zechariah 4, this prophecy spoken to Zerubbabel is about the rebuilding of the temple, and it's not by might or power, which in the Hebrew terms, ka'iel or koach, both refer to human military power and strength. So you see, God will build it by his spirit. Now, this redemptive temple from Ezekiel 40 is a spiritual temple, very much the same way to the temple that is now accessible through your faith in Jesus. Ask yourself, after the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, how was God going to make every enemy a footstool for Jesus' feet? It wouldn't be through military conquest, but by grace, truth, and spirit. That's how the church conquered the Roman Empire, arguably the strongest empire the world's ever known, after three centuries of persecution. You see, the two witnesses, and the best option, is the church. You see the reference to the lampstands of Revelation 11 and Zechariah? It's also in Revelation 1 to 12, the seven golden lampstands and the seven churches. Scholar Dr. John Newton, which I'll leave a link to his book in the description below, and is a major source for this video, sums it up perfectly. The third possibility of the two witnesses is more spiritual in nature. It understands the temple language as referring to the church, 
in line with the imagery of Revelation 1 to 3, and the trampoline as referred to persecution. The holy city thus refers to the church which is being built by Christ, as promised in Matt 16, 18. And the great city is the city of this world, which is always hostile to God. The language is seen as apocalyptic, not literal, showing the martyrdom of the believers and their ultimate triumph even leading to the conversion of their persecutors. As the ancient Christian leader Tertullian remarked, the blood of the martyrs is seed. The witnesses stand for the whole faithful anointed church, which is called to be a prophetic anointed witness, fulfilling Ezekiel's famous dry bones prophecy of Israel as noted earlier, or perhaps the combined witnesses of the Jewish and Gentile Christians. And this is the irony of the situation. People focus so hard on who the two witnesses are instead of actually focusing on what they represent. It's you. It's the church. You bear witness to the truth of Jesus Christ, even amongst persecution, which still happens today. But please understand, could there be a dual fulfillment in the future and Moses and Elijah appear? Sure. No problem with that. I have no issue with that. But you must see the spiritual fulfillment of the kingdom of God and all its power is accessible to you now through the spirit and through your faith in Jesus. You see, many Christians don't get this, but they think that the spiritual side of things is not real. In fact, it's very real. The kingdom of God is here. It is a now but not yet kingdom in which Christ will consummate his victory in total when he returns. Now, thank you for watching this video. And if you've enjoyed this content, please uh, don't forget to... Now, I know what your next question will be. If the millennial reign is here, then why is the world so evil right now? Well, stick around for the next video because the next video will be on the millennial reign. God bless.